In July 2002, the dust had finally settled. The Monday Night War was over, WCW was dead, and the WWF stood victorious. But the victory came with its own share of problems. Having absorbed WCW, the WWF's roster was now massive, and without competition, the WWF's product started to suffer. To fix this, they came up with the brand extension, which split the performers down the middle. Half the roster were assigned to the Raw brand, and the other half to the SmackDown brand. The idea was that more of the talent would get screen time, and the split would inject a sense of rivalry back into the Federation. Over the next 20 years, the brand extension would sometimes achieve these goals, and sometimes it would totally fail. However, in the early days, it was an exciting concept, and a lot of that can be attributed to Paul Heyman. Some called Bischoff a genius for introducing the New World Order, and McMahon was called a genius for inventing WrestleMania and the Attitude Era, but Paul Heyman was the real genius of American wrestling in the 90s. ECW was a hotbed of creativity as Heyman turned very average wrestlers into legendary characters and involved them in revolutionary storylines. If only Heyman was as good at business as he was at writing wrestling shows, because in the end, ECW went out of business. But Vince McMahon knew that Paul Heyman was a real genius and he signed him up to a contract in 2001 where he joined JR on commentary during the Invasion storyline. And it was at this time that the idea of a brand split was first discussed. The original plan was for the WWF to run WCW as its own brand. In the end, that plan didn't work out because many of the old loyal WCW fans didn't come over to the WWF when it went out of business. Instead, they just stopped watching wrestling altogether, and to the WWF fans, they just weren't interested in watching a version of WCW. But the core idea of running two separate brands under one umbrella was still very much on the table. But Vince McMahon had a vision. He wanted Raw and SmackDown to not only be separate on TV, but behind the scenes too. Both shows would have different creative teams, different marketing teams, and eventually their own pay-per-view schedules, and they would only ever cross over at special events like WrestleMania. Recognising Paul Heyman's creative genius, Vince McMahon made him the Blue Brand's lead writer. And this was a fantastic decision because throughout the entire history of the brand extension, this was going to be one of the very rare times that both Raw and SmackDown genuinely felt like totally different TV shows. On paper, it looked like Raw had a massive advantage on SmackDown. Raw was live on TV every Monday night while SmackDown was taped on Tuesday, but wasn't shown on TV until Thursday. The Raw brand also had more of the established main event superstars on its roster, but many fans quickly agreed that SmackDown was the better TV show, and this was all partly down to the so-called SmackDown 6, Edge, Rey Mysterio, Chris Benoit, Kurt Angle, and Eddie and Chavo Guerrero. These men quickly became the heart and the soul of the SmackDown brand, as week in and week out, they tore it up in spectacular matches against each other. Apart from Kurt Angle, none of the men had been considered true main eventers up until this point. They were either mid-carders or upper mid-carders at best, but SmackDown ended up being their proving ground, their launch pad to achieving legend status. In an interview, he said, Edge was going to be our first SmackDown branded single superstar. He was going to emerge from the pack. We needed people who could work with Edge. We needed people to work with John Cena, who was my first draft pick from OVW, 
and obviously we needed people who we could ultimately match up against Brock Lesnar. Brock Lesnar was fresh and young in 2002. He was originally drafted to the Raw brand where he won the King of the Ring and then at SummerSlam he won the WWE Undisputed Championship. There was no gradual build-up when it came to Lesnar. The company knew they had somebody really special on board and he needed a monster push. Triple H's infamous reign of terror was about to begin over on Raw and if Lesnar had stayed there then he would have ended up playing second fiddle to the game. Luckily, he became an exclusive member of Team Smackdown soon after winning the belt and this would be the making of Brock Lesnar. He was already a so-called Paul Heyman guy, in other words, one of Heyman's favourites and Heyman made it his mission to solidify Lesnar as a permanent main eventer in WWE. On screen, Heyman continued to manage Lesnar and behind the scenes, the men had a great relationship, with Lesnar trusting Heyman's decision making when it came to his career. In September, Lesnar embarked on a feud with The Undertaker, which did wonders for the careers of both men. Back in early 2002, some fans were feeling that The Undertaker was well and truly past his prime. His feuds and matches had become long and boring and there was lots of negative talk about his backstage politicking, especially towards the ex-WCW guys. The Undertaker was drafted to SmackDown in August, where he was one of the very few veterans on the roster. Over on Raw, they had the likes of Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Kane, Ric Flair, Booker T, the list goes on. But this wasn't to take as detriment. Now he was working with wrestlers like Lesnar and Kurt Angle, who he had some of his best ever matches with. Suddenly, the conversation around The Undertaker totally changed. The fans weren't talking about boring, politicking Undertaker anymore. Now they were talking about how great his matches were and how he was helping to elevate young talent. And would you believe it, even Hulk Hogan was kept to task on the 2002 SmackDown roster. Instead of pandering to Hogan, Heyman kept to his mantra of showcasing exceptional in-ring talent and focusing on building new stars. The Big Show had become a big joke by the middle of 2002, but his draft to SmackDown totally rejuvenated him. He had a new look and a new attitude, and he was presented as a credible threat to Lesnar's reign as champion. The rising stars that ended up on Heyman's roster were incredible. Lesnar, Cena, Orton, Batista. But they weren't incredible back in 2002. They were still nobodies. They ended up becoming some of the most iconic superstars in wrestling history, thanks to the start they got on Paul Heyman's SmackDown over 20 years ago. Rey Mysterio was a veteran, having spent years wowing the fans in WCW, but they kind of ruined what made him so special when they took his mask off. When he was hired by WWE, he was allowed to wear the mask once again, and his career got a new lease of life on the blue brand. Heyman negotiated to have Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit on his team in exchange for Chris Jericho, and at the time, he was laughed at backstage. But Guerrero is a prime example of a huge personality that was getting lost in the shuffle. When he came over to SmackDown, he found space to grow on the less crowded show. His time on SmackDown in 2002 and 2003 laid the foundations for his main event run just down the line. Throughout the history of the brand extension, there have been times where both Raw and SmackDown have basically felt like the same show, just with different rosters. These have been the times where Vince McMahon has had the heaviest influence on both programs. Yet, when Heyman was in charge, 
The shows never felt more different to each other. It was clear from the product that Heyman was given so much free reign to produce his vision of a wrestling show. Take the Cruiserweight division for example. McMahon would have never given the Cruiserweights so much airtime, but Heyman saw the value in the Cruiserweights as a way to differentiate the SmackDown brand from Raw. The likes of Jamie Noble, Tajiri and Matt Hardy truly made the division their own. And this version of the Cruiserweights felt totally different to what was presented in WCW. Heyman actually gave the guys good storylines to work with. And speaking of storylines, Heyman's Smackdown was characterised by stories that were generally logical and grounded Unlike what was being booked over on Raw, the Raw brand was struggling with declining ratings and resorted to cringeworthy, ridiculous plots such as hot lesbian action and the Katie Vick storyline. In contrast, SmackDown was focusing on storylines that were based around actual wrestling. That included title tournaments, the rivalry between Chris Benoit and Kurt Angle over who was the better athlete, the Undertaker's personal feud with Brock Lesnar and the relationship between Jamie Noble and Nydia, it took Heyman no time at all as the head of the brand to turn the B show into the best show. But unfortunately, Heyman often found himself at odds with Vince McMahon. They had arguments over their different approach to storytelling and character development and these arguments over the direction of SmackDown eventually culminated in Heyman being removed from his position of head writer. As soon as Heyman left, there was a noticeable shift on SmackDown back towards the juvenile humour, bizarre gimmicks and nonsense storylines that WWE is often so guilty of producing. But for a few months back at the start of the brand extension, it felt like the split was going to give us two truly distinct brands under the WWE name. And that was all thanks to Paul Heyman. 